Good morning. It's good to be with you. My name is David Erb, um, music director here uh, for the Senior Choir, and uh, it's great to be with you this week. Um, so a little bit about our program today. That may not have been what you were expecting, if you were expecting anything at all. Um, the theme uh, for our, our week together uh, this year was uh, the Singer's Village, which is based on uh, Nehemiah 12, which uh, at the rededication of the wall, it notes that the singers had built for themselves villages all around Jerusalem. As a choir director, I love that passage. Most other people don't get as excited about it, and you never hear it preached on. But the singers had built themselves villages all around Jerusalem. And I'm pretty sure I know what they were doing, because I know what singers and choir director kind of people do, is that they teach other people to do it. And so that's the... the the impetus of our, our program and all that we're singing. So this first set was uh, from the Hungarian Kodai methodology, uh, that singing school that I know they use here at Geneva and we use up in, in Moscow or, where I'm at and we uh, have a Kodai training school. Um, was excited to, to learn that our, our second violinist, she is from Hungary and she knew Kodai and she studied the Kodai method or was raised on that when uh, she was young. Um, and she sang that last piece, Lady Bird, in Hungarian uh, when she was young. So that's a wonderful connection that we have there. Um, the rest of the sets that we'll have of music today are from church schools that reside particularly in the, um, in the church, in the church's history. So the next set is from the, the Roman school, the Ro Roman or Catholic, the only church there was at that time, as the church grew uh, after Christ uh, rose and ascended. Um, the singing schools that developed in Rome and then spread throughout Christendom, known as the Schola Cantorum, or School of Singing. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Guido d'Arezzo, uh, Guido from Arezzo, um, as they started finally having notation uh, around the 10th century, 10th, 11th century, um, he was trying to find a way to teach his students to be able to start to read music better. And he took a chant that they had known for centuries um, uh, about St. John, Ut queant laxis, resonare fibris, mi rajestorum, etc. Well, the first sound of each of those phrases, if you took out the syllable and the note, made this six note scale. Ut, re, mi, fa, so, la. And he extracted that because he noticed, oh, that makes a pattern. And if I, uh, I can start to train my students. And then he w they didn't use hand signs like this, but they used a hand. It became known as the Guidonian hand. Ut, re, mi, fa, so, la. And they only had six tones, and it was called the hexachord. Eventually, ut became do. Someone changed it. And then the seventh tone, originally C, not T, and C was because Sancte Johannes, the, what the piece was about, and Johannes in Latin was I, not J, and S-I was C. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, 
to and then someone eventually changed C to T, and the rest is history, and here we are. So, you're going to hear three pieces in this set. First, the younger choirs are going to sing a mensural canon, meaning a canon in which they sing the same part eventually, but at different speeds of time, not like a row, row, row your boat round. And they're going to sing the Kyrie, and the Christe, and the Kyrie, and you'll hear that scale, that hexachord, sung up and down. Then you'll hear uh, one of our uh, faculty, Mr. Gabriel Galahan, sing that chant, which this is taken from, and then you'll hear the senior choir sing a Kyrie also, uh, using that hexachord, but it's in a more complicated form. So this is sampling from the Roman school.
frequent flyer miles there. Come down the steps. So our, our middle set is uh, the Hebrew school. Um, and we have uh, three pieces generally here, but they're all on the same text. They all come from Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant or joyful, pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. First you'll hear a canon in the Hebrew with the younger choirs, and then uh, there's going to be a little bit of moving of the uh, people furniture here, if you will, as we bring the, the senior choir down. Um, so you hear, Hinematov umanaim shevet achim gam yachad. And then when that's finished, you'll hear um, Suzanne Hike Ventura's transcription, what she believes would actually, I guess we'd have to say, be the inspired melody sung with Psalm 133. In the ancient manuscripts, there are markings on, above the words, and she, uh, she's no longer alive, but she thought that she cracked the code to decipher those pitches. And so this is her rendition of it. I, there are others that disagree. There's others that came up with their own uh, different solutions. But anyway, you get a sense of perhaps what it might have sounded like, um, the whole of the text in Hebrew. And then we'll sing uh, in English, so we provide a translation, which the Bible instructs us to do if we're going to be in a, in a different tongue than our own. We'll sing, the choirs will sing Psalm 133. It's a setting of mine. kind of has a Hebraic folk feel to it. Uh, the music will be projected up on the screen when we get to that, and you can follow it. Um, and when we're finished, I'll again give a brief introduction, and then we invite you to give it a go uh, if you feel able to do it. And if not, you can just enjoy the others around you who are able to do it and, and say to yourself, ah, I need to keep working on my musical literary, literacy skills because as you all like to sing, when you've been there, that is heaven, 10,000 years bright shining as a sun, you've no less days to sing God's praise than when you first begun. So if God gives you another 20 years... By the 20th concert you come to after this, I'd expect that you'll do better with a new song that you don't know, because you'll get better, because you know that's what you're going to be doing in heaven. So, get going. So, and of course, that's what we're all about here, is, is learning to read music. So this is Psalm 133 from the Hebrew Singing Village uh, model.
Well, the idea of singing school made it from Israel all the way through Europe and to all sorts of parts of it and across the pond to the American singing school, a little closer to home. So the American singing school uh, took place, of course, mainly on the, the eastern side of the United States and a little different from some of the other singing schools on our, uh, on our program today in that it uh, was much more directed at the entire congregation rather than uh, just the students and sometimes even just the select uh, more advanced students. So not all singing schools were exactly the same in their model. Um, some have certain strengths and uh, other weaknesses. But the American Singing School uh, was led by usually itinerant singing masters, the most famous of whom was William Billings. And so they would travel from church to church uh, along the east, eastern part of the United States, and they would spend a couple weeks to a month, and the whole congregation, or most of them in many cases, would come every night of the week. I just start to envision this. Every night of the week, for about a month, you'd come to study how to sing music. Not just sing it, but to read it, really. That was the main thrust, is to be able to read it. And they even put in the front of many of their hymnals back in those days a music theory textbook with the pitches and the rhythms and the key signatures and how to learn to read the music. Because if you're going to be looking at the music, you need to know how to read it. Just like if you're going to have a Bible before you, someone's got to teach you to read. But we don't, we don't teach reading with Genesis 1 usually. There are other things, like you heard the songs of the Kodai method. Well, that helps them to get where they can read their Bibles, musically speaking, right? They can get from Here Comes a Cuckoo to the Dona Nobis Pachim that you'll hear at the end of the performance tonight. And so it's a wonderful thing. So in this set, you're going to hear first a fuguing tune, and you'll recognize these words, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. But this is different music. Uh, it's a setting of mine. It's in the style of a fuguing tune, where the second part of the music, everyone gets the melody at a different time. So um, one of the reasons both uh, my psalm and the last and this fuguing tune is these ideas, these things that happened in these different styles still happen today. So we don't only have to trot out old music, but the, it's still alive. So you'll hear a fuguing tune on that hymn, and then you're going to hear around the old singing school. And this is just kind of fun. They're going to tell you all the kinds of things they do in the singing school about singing scales and tas and titis and singing with accent strong. So it's not a serious piece. Don't, don't worry. Um, and then we'll end with, what are we going to end with in this set? Oh, yeah, the uh, Billings Easter Anthem. We have a nod to Billings, the most famous singing master. Um, this is uh, talking about Jesus rising from the dead, a very hearty uh, song. Um, sometimes congregation would sing this. This is a little bit more choral in its nature, uh, but still in the early American style. So, the American Singing School.
So this is the final set proper, and we have one more piece for you. Um, this is the German Latin Schule, the German La Latin school. Uh, a lot of these students go to a Latin school, it's just not in German. Um, but the next two pieces you'll hear are in German. Uh, so all three pieces, though, in this set are the same melody. Um, most of you, I think, know how lovely shines the morning star. This is written by a pastor. Philip Nikolai, he wrote both the text and the music for this famous hymn. We tend to sing it during Advent, sometimes during Epiphany, um, but actually it's based on the 45th Psalm, the ideas in it are, and that is the wedding psalm. I don't know how many of you had that sung at your wedding, but God gave us a psalm in, of his 150, that's a wedding psalm, and uh, that's what we have here. But when Nikolai wrote it, he wrote it for a time that uh, much worse than ours, uh, to be sure. But um, there was a plague that went through uh, where he was living in Germany at that time. And it killed many, many people, including one of his uh, dear friends and students, Wilhelm Ernst. And he was a prince, and he had lots of names and titles after that. So Wilhelm Ernst, uh, let's see, Wilhelm Ernst uh, zu Graf und Herr von Waldeck or something like that. So there, he had se there were seven letters in his name and title. Well, Nikolai wrote each verse of the hymn as an acrostic. So the first, uh, Wilhelm, starts with a W, and so does V, although we say it like a V in German, W-I-E. And then the second, Ernst, starts with an E, and the second verse begins with a letter E, and so forth. So it's a hidden uh, tribute uh, to his friend and student who had died in the plague. So you'll hear here two different settings. The first um, is uh, for the, the junior choir, and they're going to sing what's called a bicinium. And again, our theme is singing schools. So 
this was where the students would go from having just learned the tunes, the church hymns, and then they would start learning to sing more difficult, complex parts in polyphony to prepare them for more mature music. And so you're going to hear that. Their parts will alternate. You'll recognize the melody, but it's not just the melody. It's ornamented. And that'll be followed by a uh, more mature or full composition, still by Praetorius, one of the great great church musicians in the history of the church. If you don't know about Praetorius, I encourage you to, to get to know him and his music. He wrote tons of it, tons and tons of church music. And he particularly uh, focused on the music, the hymnody of the church. So there's lots of music related to, to songs you might know. Um, so the, the fuller setting of this, there'll be a group of soloists that alternate with the full choir, and then they join together. So they kind of sing the melody in an ornamented uh, fashion, and then the choir will come in and sing it in a very straight fashion, so we recognize that. Now, when we're done with both of those in German, you'll hear the organ play a uh, brief uh, introduction, and then we invite you to sing with us all seven verses of How Lovely Shines the Morning Star. Uh, the music will be up on the, the screen, so you'll be able to see that there. So this is the German Latin school. Und 
All right, well, five different singing schools throughout history, and now it's your turn. I didn't tell you this on purpose, so you wouldn't have come today. Okay, well, they've been working for years and all week, but for years, on learning how to read music. And we're going to try just a little sample for you. Now, some of you out there know how to read music pretty well. Some of you know how to read it, well, kind of. You, you know, you remember back in middle school or something like that. And some of you, nothing. But even those of you who say, I know nothing about reading music, we're going to try right now, and you're going to see how easy it is. So I think most of you recognize this little, this little song. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. Can you sing that with me? Follow the yellow brick road again. Follow the yellow brick road. Do you suppose you could play that on your four fingers? Follow the yellow brick road and sing. Follow the yellow brick road. Once more. Follow the yellow brick road. Now, like Guido did, we're going to take our solfege and we're going to sing Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Mi, Re, Do. I'll do it once more. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Mi, Re, Do. And sing. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Mi, Re, Do. So just four notes up and down. Uh, if you could bring that slide up, then they can see what that looks like. At least I hope. Oh, there we are. That first line of music. Do, re, mi, fa, mi, re, do. Would you sing it now looking at the music? This is, of course, one of the ways children learn to read English, is while you're reading to them, they're just looking at the words all the time. And that helps them when you start to teach phonics and whatnot. Ready and sing. Do, re, mi, fa, mi, re, do. And sing it again. Do, re, mi, fa, mi, re, do. And you can see it alternates note heads in lines and spaces. Okay, it just goes up and you can see that. They're all next door neighbors, so to speak, right? Well, would you sing for me, you don't have to look up there right now, but would you sing for me another song that I think you know? Just the first line. When I survey the wondrous cross, sing. When I survey the might try singing that while you play it on your four fingers, like this. I'll give you a demonstration. When, now sometimes they repeat. They don't just go up and down this time. When I survey the wondrous cross. Try it, okay? You can follow me. I'll help you. Ready and go. When I survey the Now the music is the second line that you see up on the screen. That's what you just sang. So sing now not on when I survey the wondrous cross, but your challenge is to go do, do, re, mi, re, mi, fa, mi, re, mi, up and down. Try it. If you fail, that's okay. Students fail all the time, and then we practice it and get better. Ready and sing. Do, do, re, mi, re, mi, fa, mi, re, mi. Let's do that one more time. I'm sure there was at least one person who made a mistake. Okay, we'll try it again. One of the things about reading music I tell the students all the time, really it's no different than Sesame Street. It all comes down to is it the same or is it different? And if it's different, how is it different? Is it higher or is it lower? Is it higher by just one step, or is it higher by more than that? And we start to discern the differences when it's not the same. So the first two tones are the same. And we recognize that, and then we can call them both the same thing, do. Let's try it one more time. Ready and sing. Do, do, re, mi, re, mi, fa, mi, re, mi. Very good. Now, if you look at the third line of music, and we play the same and different game, does it look at least similar to any of the other lines of music that are on that page? Hopefully some of you are realizing it kind of looks like the first line. It's just not in the same spot. That's kind of like you could sing, uh, follow the yellow brick road way up here, but some of you have lower voices and you might go, follow the yellow brick road. It's the same melody, but it's notated in a different place. So we don't have to sing it so high. So can you sing that, that third line? We'll take it here, follow the yellow brick road. But you're very good now, you can do solfege. Do, re, mi, fa, mi, re, do, and sing. 
Do, re, mi, fa, mi, re, do. Once more, just for, for the practice. And sing. Do, re, mi, fa, mi, re, do. Very good. Now that last line of music, there are more half notes, more white notes there. But you might notice that the beginning of it looks a lot like follow the yellow brick road, doesn't it? The shape, the going up. So again, we try to find similar things. The choir's going to sing that for you first on solfege. The, the Bach Dononobis, first phrase, do, re, mi, fa. Ready? You follow it with your eyes and listen to their solfege. Ready? And go. Do, re, mi, fa, si, re, mi, do, fa. Your turn, you have to try. If you make a mistake, it's okay. It's all right. I won't send a report card home that says F. Okay? Let's try it. So sing with them. Do, re, mi, fa. And it jumps around a little bit more. I'm sure some of you are going to face plant, but do your best. Whatever you do, don't just sit there doing nothing. Redeem the time, the Lord says, for the days are evil. And we see that today. So you may as well learn to read music since the days are so evil. Let's try it. Ready and here we go. Do, re, mi, fa, mi, re, mi, do, fa, mi, re, do. That was so good, I'm not going to make you do it again. <laughs> and all God's people said, Amen. Yeah. Okay, so this theme, this very simple theme, just do, re, mi, fa, the same as uh, so many simple songs, is the opening motive to the end of one of the most famous pieces in the history of Western civilization, the Dona Nobis Pachem from the B minor mass by Johann Sebastian Bach. And you're going to hear now, if you would turn to the, the screen, uh, that's, it's small, but at the very bottom you'll see all of the voice parts entering, and they're going to sing that motive at different pitches. Do, re, mi, fa, then the tenor sing it higher, do, re, mi, fa, and then the altos sing it in their range, and then the sopranos come in, and you're going to hear that throughout the work. And now you know it, because you've learned it, and you've sight sung it. But look at the next page, because Bach doesn't do just one theme, he does a second theme. Now, aren't you glad I'm not asking you to sight sing that? There are two different styles colliding here. The first is an old, old style in Bach's day, old even for him. And then he writes this one, and this is kind of modern music in Bach's time. And then he weds them together into this glorious plea for uh, peace in our time. And it's something we, uh, Christians, of course, throughout history are always asking the Lord to grant us peace in the light of wars, in the light of plague, uh, civil unrest. We ask God to send us peace. So that's what we'll end you with today. And I want to remind you, the very beginning, those cuckoo songs, that's not just, well, the kids must do something. It's that that gets them to hear. When Kodai started his method, it was that that would lead all the way to this. And that's why we raise up our children this way. So thank you again for the opportunity to come down and teach your children and to be down here to visit with you and to fellowship with you and feast with you. It's a pleasure. I love coming down to Monroe and West Monroe now. Thank you.